gun method, you know. But Well, praise the Lord. It's been, I think the last time we were here was 2019 before all the, all the mess happened and in the world and things got chaotic. So it's, it's uh, good to be back with you to share the word of God. And uh, when we were invited to, to come back up and share, I told Chelsea, I said, I don't know what I'm going to share. And so um, it was really neat. So anyways, I'm not, I'm not very good at small talk. Uh, but it's good to be here. Uh, I sincerely mean that it's good to be here. It's good to share the word with the body of Christ. Um, you know, what a privilege it is for us to, to have Bibles and then to have Bibles in multiple translations and then back it up a little more to have a place to meet together where we don't have to fear. Like many in the world, you know, it makes me think of the, the Chinese Christians, you know, reading the Bible by candlelight with one page of the scriptures that they pass around to one another. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's really humbling, you know, to, to have what we have, you know. Um, so, without further ado, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and uh, see what he has for us this morning. So, Father, we thank you for another day. And not only another day, but another day that we can gather together as your people, where we can fellowship with one another as your people in a world where lots of things are going on, in a world where there's so much opportunity for offense, for strife, for arguing, for quibbling over things that, and missing the big picture. There's so much opportunity to get sidetracked and to be at odds with one another. But we thank you this morning, God, that you have never changed, that the mission for your people has never changed, that the Holy Spirit still does the exact same things that he has always done, that you still dwell with your people as you always have. Lord, that you are the same, you've gone nowhere. You, you are near us at all times. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that blessed assurance. We thank you for the rock that is Christ. We thank you for having the opportunity to place our feet on unmovable ground. And so we love you this morning. We thank you this morning. We glorify the name of Jesus this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So the title for the message this morning, it really it can be a lot of things because there's been a common thread in the last few years in what the Lord has had me share. And the title of the message this morning is Seeing and Embracing Revival and the Spirit-Filled Life. And now, when we hear those words, a lot of times things come to our mind about what that means. And I just, I want to challenge you this morning to not think you know what I'm going to talk about with those topics, okay? Um, so, um, did you know that the word revival is not found in the New Testament? Neither Jesus nor Paul nor any other biblical writer encouraged prayer for revival. Revival is a word that developed in the church's history, not in the church's origin. You know, we see many church signs with revival meeting written on them, typically means uh, a week's worth of high-octane uh, preaching services. Some may think of great manifestations that fell on almost whole nations. You know, you think of a man named Evan Roberts. He was just one guy, and, and uh, he, he just decided to just take hold of God. And so when everyone else was asleep in the late hours of the night, he really pressed in to, to you know, you read things in the Scriptures, and, and, and we can be in church for many, many years, and things become cliche to us, and they, the weight of them moving our hearts can be lost a lot of times. That's a, I always tell our young people and youth, I say, you know church is a very dangerous place to be. It's a great place to be, but there's dangers that come along with it. And one of those dangers is, is to hear the word, to think you know it, but there's no practical application in your life. 
And there's warnings in, in the book of Revelation for certain churches. The whole New Testament is full of warnings in the epistles to the different bodies throughout the regions that the apostles visited and planted churches. Um, you know, Evan Roberts, we think about the, the Welsh revival or in Ireland. Uh, we've had the opportunity to um, team up with a ministry in Derry, Ireland and uh, do, do street ministry. And there's, there's a very high suicide rate and there's, there's different things going on over there. That, and the Lord's moving. But there was a time, you know, we were over there. They told us stories about, you know, you drive down the road or, or walk down the road and, and playgrounds would have little kids on their knees. No one else was around them. There would be old men on the sidewalks with their arms up to heaven. And, and, and just a massive nationwide move of God. But in all, of those, in all of those big moves that we tend to look at and they tend to be reported on and they tend to be the front page news of, of what it's all about, one revival, there were two ladies that prayed. The Irish revival, there were two men who, who would, would pray for hours at a time. Right, not just a repetition of earning something from God, but they were really seeking and laying hold of God. And then, as, as we're going to see in the scriptures, God did what God says he'll do. Amen? There's, no, there's, no, there's, there's mystery at times, but there's no mystery um, where God has gave us clear instructions, right? Now, there's, ministry, there's, there's mystery in the day. You know, how's it going today? All good, same day. Well, yeah, we do the same things, but it's really different every day. You know, we wear different clothes. We run into different people. Um, you know, different thoughts come into our minds, right? Every day is different, even though it's the same. So anyways, um, let's get where we're going here. I must have been scrolling while I was talking. I was down a little ways, fidgeting with my hands. Um, we have too many coined phrases in our churches today that are incomplete and actually have the potential of misleading one another. One in particular is, are you filled with the Spirit? And because of what we've heard about this topic, many of us only think about speaking in tongues when the phrase is heard. Instead of thinking about what a life will look like if the very Spirit of God was filling one. The same spirit Jesus had while walking the earth, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, dwells in us if we belong to him. You know, uh, I said, well, Eminem, the rapper, speaks in tongues on one of his older albums. And one celebrity says she speaks in tongues all the time and periodically does pagan rituals with her boyfriend where they consume drops of one another's blood. Well, most Christians realize those actions are not of God's spirit and are in fact demonic, but why don't we believe as the Bible shows us that the definition of being filled with the spirit doesn't just equal tongues? Now that being said, it doesn't mean speaking in tongues isn't biblical, but it does mean that it's much, much more than that. And we see 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30 and 31 is a little glimpse into that thought. Um, some prophesied, some received boldness to proclaim the word of God. Some were selected to serve tables like Stephen. Some initially spoke in other languages as we see on the day of Pentecost. The definition of revival, because remember, we're talking about embracing revival this morning. And, and we're going to look at what, what revival is. You know, we pray for revival, but what is this thing that we're praying for? What if it was something closer to home that we could embrace and, and have right now? and move with right now. That's what we're looking at this morning. Just like Jesus said, I'm not far away. Moves of God, or that what we call moves of God, aren't far away either. And then in the most basic level, he's here with us right now. The definition of arrival is to return to consciousness or life, become active or flourishing again, to restore to consciousness or life, to restore from a depressed, inactive, or unused state. To bring back. To renew in the mind or memory. You know, to restore from a depressed, you know. That's uh, uh, a good thing, isn't it? I fear this morning because we have heard about revival a particular way. The message this morning may slip through the cracks, but we've already covered that. I want to give you a different than usual but extremely biblical 
look at revival. One thing that is for certain with revival and everything I see in the scriptures is we should never chase the wow. We should never chase the wow. But a lot of times when we think revival, we're looking at the wow. But the Bible tells me when I read it, never to chase the wow. And if you guys want to, to go over to John chapter 6 with me, we're not going to expound the text completely for what it is, the, the full chapter, but we are going to look at um, a few aspects of it that kind of paint the picture of what, what we're talking about this morning. So every one of us know the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? Sunday school lesson, right? Jesus walking on the water which were miracles that happened in the exact same day, which when I read that, I just, it just never clicked that those things happened the exact same day. Did you guys know that? Fed the 5,000 like it must have been lunchtime. Maybe they had brunch, right? <laughs> a long day with one another. And then Jesus kind of went off like he did and prayed. And the, the disciples said, well, we're going to take the boat over. And then Jesus, Jesus showed up to him walking on the water that same evening as feeding the 5,000. But what happened the very next day? Do we hear the, do we, do we intently look at what happened the next day? You know, I'm, I bet a handful of us don't realize that we see the next day from those things. Um, you know, our Christians, are, lives are lived and proved true the next day. Um, so in John 6, starting in verse 22, we see the crowds that had been following Jesus woke up, began looking around and wondered, where is everybody? <laughs> right? You know, you, you, you go to a healing service or you go to revival meetings, right? And you wake up the next day and you're like, oh, what happened last night? Well, thank you, Jesus. But then things can dissipate. In John 6, we see the crowds. They don't have to. We see the crowds that had been following Jesus woke up, began looking around and wondered, where is everybody? Where is Jesus? The disciples had taken the only boat that was there at the time. And that's a paraphrase of, of, of what's there. So they boarded the boats that had come over from Tiberias and landed near where the 5,000 had eaten and went across from there to Capernaum to look for Jesus. Verse 25 tells us they found him and when they did, they asked him, when did you get here? Jesus didn't small talk with them. He said, you want, verse 26, you want to be with me because I fed you not because you understood the miraculous signs. You want to be with me because the miraculous sign and it benefited you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. Spend time not seeing or being concerned with perishable things like food, for example, but that's a broad, broad spectrum. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life the Son of Man can give you, for God the Father has given me the seal of approval. In verse 28, they replied, we want to perform God's works too. Jesus just pegged it, didn't he? They said, well, we want to perform God's works too. Well, we were following you for the food, but we also want to perform God's, God's miraculous works too. In verse 29, Jesus replied, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Why? Because God has his plans and purposes and timings, and the initial access point of his kingdom is through his son, the Messiah, Jesus. Humility, self-denial, surrender, obedience, these are the people God can use and entrust his pearls to. Believe in the one he sent. What happens when we believe in the one he sent, when we humble ourselves? Then the Holy Spirit can come into our lives, right? That's what he was getting at. Verse 30 and 31, to that they answered, they got a little offended, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? Uh, yesterday at lunchtime, 5,000 people were fed with a very, very small amount of food and you saw it, right? But they didn't like what he had to say. You know, when we look at stuff like that, we really have to be careful chasing the wow. Because when we chase the wow, our motives can get so out of whack so quickly. And we're going to see that as we, as we cruise through today. After all, our ancestors ate meta, manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them manna from heaven. 
To which Jesus said in verse 32, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did. Just as the father fed the 5,000, and now he offers you the true bread from heaven. Then further on he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. What? Jesus' words brought a dividing line to their views. They were coming to Jesus for one reason, and Jesus said that reason's not going to last Everyone likes miraculous signs. Everyone likes seeing that. But there's a root that gives us power to continue. There's a root that gives us power to stay united. There's a root that gives us power to not get offended. There's a root that gives us the power to be the body of Christ as we see in the scriptures. The people followed the miracles, they came to Jesus for things, but their motives were wrong, and they failed to actually believe and follow Jesus. Verse 56 says, anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word of God is the bread of life. And that is what sustains and maintains us. It sustains and gives remaining revival. The signs and wonders the people were chasing weren't the revival. They were pointing to him. Their revival was a lot closer than they thought. Embracing revival, being filled, spirit-filled, uh, probably has a hand in being revived, right? So we're going to look at some aspects of the spirit-filled life. So I challenge you to not, not let it go in one ear and out the other because it's probably a little different perspective. So let's... Uh, Let's look in the book of Acts here. As we start talking about the spirit-filled life, it's important. Okay, let me see a few things up front. Um, the first thing we see in Acts chapter 5, which I'll go ahead and read it since there's a few verses, verse 23 through 32. It says, The jail was securely locked with a guard standing outside. But when we opened the gates, no one was there. When the captain of the temple guard and the leading priests heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Then someone arrived. Wait, am I in the right place? Yeah. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council where the high priest confronted them. Didn't we tell you never again to teach in this man's name, he demanded? Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. But Peter replied, Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey Him. He's given, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. Now initially, repent, be baptized. Right? That's the initial command. But then we see, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled. One time they went out and some things happened. And I think, actually, I think it says, if we continue on reading that exact same section, it says they prayed for boldness and the place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What we, the section we just read confirms what we read in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, where it says, once we were eating with them, once when we were eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives instructions to the apostles about not leaving Jerusalem until the Father sends the gift of the Holy Spirit to them. He gave them a command and a promise in which God did as he said, as the apostles and the others did what God said. They didn't earn it or deserve it. They weren't even trying to earn it. Their devotion and affection was set on God himself. You know, we can get into stuff where it's like any, any mention of obedience or works can be like legalism. I'll say a scripture right now and it'll probably suck the oxygen out of the place. I'll say it in context. 
You are saved by works and not faith alone. Yay! See, it's a challenge, isn't it? Now, we're very familiar with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You are saved by grace through faith that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. You flip over to James chapter 2, and he says, was he not saved by works and not faith alone? Did you know that those scriptures are not contradictory and they gel together perfectly? But we get in one vein when we read the scriptures and we get verses to, to empower us and we try to make a foundation where we'll never slip with, with uh, you know, verse of the day or life verses. But when we do that, we cut out other stuff that does not contradict. This is the word of God or it's not. If we're picking and picking through it and doing that, we can't trust it. But if it is indeed the word of God as it is the word of God, every word of it has a purpose. So the difference between those two sections is you can never earn salvation. You can never be good enough. Jesus died on the cross. He lived the perfect righteous life and we are made righteous by His Spirit coming in. Our sins are covered, but then we also receive power to say no to sin as we see in Titus chapter 2. It doesn't mean we won't ever trip. You know, our world, you know, Satan is just a giant temptation billboard in our thoughts and then actually there's giant temptation billboards you know it's it's it doesn't mean that we're not going to stumble but it does mean that we have power to say no it does mean when we miss it it doesn't control us it was like how stupid was i for that god forgive me help me what's going on that i keep giving into this and we can ask those questions without condemnation so to not leave you hanging on those two. One is works to be right with God, which no one can ever do because Jesus did that. The other one is works of faith, works that happen because the Spirit of God lives in you. And if the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, what does our life look like? The whole New Testament is full. The Apostle Paul, which we're going to see in a minute, First Corinthians, he's like, I didn't even know how to talk to you guys. If you're people who have been born again or not, if you have the Spirit or not, I, I didn't know how because of what's going on. Works of faith that show. Another section, Paul says, I work hard to show my salvation. See, that's not legalism, but it is a challenge to where the alliance of our heart is. What are we aligned with? What do we really love? If you're on the right side, there's no condemnation. If you're on the other side, that's a rough spot to be in if your heart isn't aligned with with God. You know, if a person does shameful things, you should absolutely feel shame. That's a gift from God. If you're serving God with all your heart and you're just going after it and you're like, oh man, I keep messing up. Lord, I need to know more. God, help me to love others better. Oh, but then shame's trying to get on you. You grab it, you flip the laces and you take a few steps and you kick it like my friend in high school. He could punt a football from one goal line to the other. That, he had a boot on him. But one aspect of shame is absolutely proper and from the Holy Spirit. You know, if, we, if we're doing shameful things and we're trying to get rid of shame, all we're doing is searing our conscience. If we're doing shameful things and we come to God and open our life up, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all righteousness, to bring out His best and put it on us, to take us in to say, listen, I know what it's, you know, I've watched humanity for a long time, you know. We're all in different places. Should I forgive my brother seven times in a day? Not seven times, but 70 times seven. In unlimited time, if your brother comes back with a repentant heart and says, forgive me. It's wide open. The door is wide open. There is nothing pushing us out of the kingdom of God. But there is something that can keep us from coming into it. What does he say? The, it's a narrow gate. We can't carry the luggage and all our goodies through that. It's only the size of us to fit through. Okay, that maybe that was for someone this morning. That wasn't in my notes. Amen? Amen. And that also what we just shared about obedience 
He makes me think of the Great Commission. You know, that's another thing. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the third part? Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. You know, church, that is, that is our purpose. Let's cruise on and we're going to see that purpose. We are so filled with purpose from, from, from you know, we, we think from pastor to, you know, it's from, from give me the most perfect level line, pastor to nursery worker to youth pastor to music minister to greeter to person who cleans and no one ever sees to people who love the Lord and come to church and don't really have a ministry yet. Do, or a ministry meaning very involved with stuff. Maybe we don't even know. Maybe that person's inviting people over to their house and having fellowship, as we're going to see in a little bit. It is a solid level line. Every one of us, as the body of Christ, have purpose. The number one purpose is to, to obey Jesus. That's the most, one of the most special things we can do. We have value. It's a joy to obey Him. It's not a weight because we're not earning righteousness. We're being made righteous already. And we've seen His kingdom is better. We've seen that His ways are better. We've had our ways long enough and, and <laughs> we get a tummy ache so often, but yet for whatever weird reason, if there's no other reason you can see spiritual warfare as a dog returns to its vomit, the Apostle Paul said it like this, the things I want to do, I, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Who's going to save me from this body of death? I see what's going on. I hate it. I really need help. Thanks be to God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He doesn't just save us from the penalty of sin. He saves us from the power. He doesn't just save us from the penalty. He saves us from the power. The first revival or awakening we see uh, after Christ's resurrection is in Acts chapter 1. We see that they obeyed what Jesus said. And then in Acts chapter 2, uh, or say, when they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Um, this is Acts chapter 1, sorry. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer. Now, if you think, if you want to... You know, it's amazing throughout the scriptures, through the, the different epistles how much that word united is in there. If you want to flip over Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he's talking about united. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he's talking about his desire for them to be united. Well, guess what? They weren't united, but the apostles were there and they were united. You see that? He's, he's saying, guys, come back, come back. You're not united. But let's see what happened when they were. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. They were united. They were united in prayer. Peter stood up and addressed them. They were listening to what the one who had been with Jesus had to say. And then we know what happened. Just like God had promised, the Holy Spirit came upon each one of them. They began speaking in other languages. People who were in town for the festival, who were from all different countries, heard their languages spoken by these country folks from Galilee, proclaiming the mysteries and majesty of God. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You see, we, sometimes we think about, well, did, did I pray in tongues? Like, why did I... Did you feel this? Well, I kind, of, I kind of mumbled some stuff. What about when the Holy Spirit came? Set that aside. Doesn't mean it's not important. These men were seeking God. Something happened, and it impacted multitudes. Where that day, 3,000 people were added to the church because these men, they got their attention. God said, hey, listen, there's something going on here. Whoa. These are country guys. They haven't studied languages. Boom. Okay, you got our attention. Peter stood up and he walked them through the plan and purposes of God. He walked them through Christ at the consummation of time for him to come and die on the cross for the sins of the world. And it says they were cut to the heart. And 3,000 were added to the church that day. These people obeyed God and it went from one little group to a bigger group. 
and it carried on. But a lot of times we look at all the big, wow stuff, and we're missing everything he's given us to have the joy of the Lord and then to see that joy spread to others in our congregation and then to see that spread to others around the area. A lot of times we miss it because we're looking in the wrong place. The effects of this revival are seen where Peter preached to the crowd and verse 41 said, those who believe Peter's message were baptized. Okay, I said that. Personal revival spread to a group and a group to a bigger group. This is the beginning of the ministry of the church. Then thereafter, we see the effect that embracing, they embraced revival. Jesus told them something, then they did it. They embraced revival. Jesus said, I'm promising something, and they knew who Jesus was, and they said, I want what he's promising more than anything else. Guys, we're not going anywhere. We're going to meet together. He said he's, he's, he's going to do this. We're going to wait on him. Because it sure is the sun coming up the next day. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. Yeah, but we need to go preach to everyone. He told us to come and do this right now. Yeah, but that's important. But yeah, but why are you doing that? Do you want to obey Jesus? You know, can you, can you turn the TV off for two hours? Right? Can you? What has a hold on? See? See, we, we, we get these things that we think are going to make us feel better to do, and they never do. They never do. Because the thing that is exactly what we need is right there, and it's so much easier. But we have to deal with ourselves. And that's a, that's a plus, right? Just get that old self out of the way and lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Christians and those who've been born again, those who haven't been born again alike. It's a continual thing. Continuous. Let's look over, read a couple of effects. Chapter 2, verse, starting in verse, 30, verse 42. Verse 42. Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. We read over that verse pretty quick. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Wouldn't it be great to just enjoy the goodwill of everyone? And they, they, weren't, they weren't like, you know, you get together to church function sometimes and you feel like you're just working to, to be there, you know. You can, and we, put, we can put a lot of pressure on ourselves to perform in front of people. I mean, we can just be talking and sweating. And it's like, man, we can just relax and be myself and others can be who they are. And we can get along even if we, you know, maybe we should shrink down the topics we're talking about a little bit. You know, with this TV show, that TV, well, yeah. What about Jesus? What's the Lord doing in your life? What's, what's on your heart? What do you care about? Right? That's That's fellowship. I always, I always tease my wife. She'll be like, go and have some fellowship. I was like, oh, we're going to be sitting around talking about what the Lord's done in our lives. And she's like, you know what I mean. And I'm like, no, I know what you mean, but that's what fellowship means. All the while praising God and joining the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And then in chapter 4, verse 32 through 37, it says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. We see that again. And they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the Isle of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. So we see a view of the church in an unwrinkled state, right? We saw, you know, you guys, I want you to be united, and they were. Amen? But then we also see dangers of revival. We're going to touch on that real quick, and then we don't have very much further to, to close. But the dangers of revival, we see things like Ananias and Sapphira. That's a danger of revival. It really is. How many of us have done a similar thing like Ananias and Sapphira and we haven't dropped dead? 
right? We, we see, you know, we try to get, in, get into a place and kind of buddy up with the person who's in charge and, and try to kind of squeeze in there at the top and then be seen for your generosity when really you just want to be seen for it. The, the amount of generosity wasn't there. You know, you know how common that is? You know, we, we all want to feel important instead of taking Jesus' view of what he considers important because his eye is on each and every one of us in a good way. We, we, we go for, for bankrupt things to fulfill us. And so we know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. There was something. We just read what was going on amongst that group. And for whatever reason, what Ananias and Sapphira did, God was not having it. He was not having that among that group of people who was participating with one another that way. They weren't just grinding it out. They were 100% genuine, enjoying one another and going after the Lord. Oh, well, that's impossible. You just severed yourself from being able to embrace revival. Well, we could never do that. I mean, today, we're severing ourselves from revival. But I know when I read that, I those thoughts tried to come into my mind. And I'm like, no, 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 Lord. And we have to no, 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 Lord, a lot of times when we think we know what's being said and look at it a little closer. The church in a precious, unwrinkled state, and then we saw Ananias and Sapphira. We also see 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in our young adult meeting. Um, we've been having a young adult meeting in our home for I don't know how many months now. We started out talking about biblical salvation and then we've, we've come into 1 Corinthians, um, and we've, I don't know how many weeks we've been at it, but we're on like chapter 6. Um, but we, we do it every other week, and we had a few weeks that we missed. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see a danger, a danger to revival. And because of time, I will summarize about 1 Corinthians. God bless it and make it clear. Dangers of revival, we see what Ananias and Sapphira did, but another danger of revival we see in Corinthians. What happened to the Corinthians were, in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, they were, they were poor people. The majority of the Corinthian church were poor, unimportant, and really nothing in the world. They were poor, they were unimportant. They just, there's nothing special about them. But they went from that, they went from nothing special to feeling special about themselves. And so, if we want to talk about the book in the New Testament that talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're looking at the Corinthians. All the manifestations we get a real good glimpse of in the book of 1 Corinthians. Do you know in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, he encourages them. He says, listen, and you could tell he was getting ready to write some really sharp things to them because he said, listen, I see the evidence of God among you. He's enriched you guys in all of your speech, meaning you can communicate the message so clearly and so simply, and it's so easy to grasp. God has enriched you, and this is evidence of what I told you about Christ being true. Then he carries on and he goes into it. And the first thing he addresses is divisions in the church. Well, this speaker speaks so much better than this one. I mean, oh, how easy is that in a local church nowadays with preacher galore on the internet, preacher galore at nighttime telling you to buy this little bottle of something and God's going to send you something? You know, I mean, it's just, you can hear, there are so many voices in the world. So many confessing church voices. But this group went from having nothing to being enriched by God, to feeling alive and feeling great, to feeling the significance of their life because it is very significant. Every one of our lives are significant. But they went from feeling, to feeling special about themselves. They started dividing over the speaker. Chapter 3 at the end, the apostle Paul says, you guys are arguing about this, and it is, it's ridiculous, guys. I'm paraphrasing. Do you not know that God cares about you so much, Corinthians, that he gave us ministers to you 
We are nothing. We are just people who are delivering what God wants to share with you because you are on his heart and mind all the time. That's what he said at the end of chapter 3. That's a paraphrase. All things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or the world or life or death. So, summing up right here. Pastor Chris, I'm trying to... Got a lot of notes. But we're not going to get to them. But I think what God has wanted to share has, has come into view. So aspects of embracing revival that we see from the Corinthians are, the Apostle Paul said, you have all the spiritual gifts you need. Chapter 1, verse 9. You have all the spiritual gifts you need until Christ returns. They, they became so proud of themselves and just seeking manifestations of this and of that and proud of this. And then in chapter 5, we see there was a person in the, the church there who at best was having incest with his stepmom. It's at best. It says the wife, the, the literal translation is the, his, his father's wife. And the some translation says stepmom, it doesn't say that. The visions were going on. That kind of stuff was going on. They're going after manifestations and it's all this stuff. And the Corinthian church was crumbling underneath their noses. We see they weren't even looking for manifestations, but they did what Jesus said. They laid down there. You know, they came after him. They laid things down. They listened to the apostles' teaching. They were united with one another. The Corinthians had gotten away from that. They got out of that because they started feeling good. And if there's anything that's a temptation for all of us, it is that we want to feel good rather than have righteousness. We just want to feel better. Everyone wants to feel better. That's why so many things going on in the world that are, that are way out of line with God's word, you, just, you, don't, you can't say anything about that. It's hate speech. You just pat them on the back and say it's okay. It is not. A band-aid can't fix what needs surgery. But the good news is the great physician can have you in surgery and have us out of surgery and it's like nothing ever happened. We, church, y'all are, are brothers and sisters of mine from a different, different town. Just like when we've gone to India, that's brothers and sisters of ours on a different continent. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And if we want revival, if we got the, God to do something, right? If we want to see the words on these pages come forth like we read about, and then when we don't see it, we're tempted to say, well, all of these instructions are for us. We can be Corinthians. We can be Ephesians. We don't want to be able to identify what's right and wrong but then have left our first love. Revelation. We don't want to be the Laodicean church. Oh, we don't have need of anything. Bless God, we're in. Have a reputation for being away, but really underneath that, not doing very good. The great physician wants to heal us here. He wants to heal our body back home. He wants to heal churches all across the United States. He wants to switch up how churches do things. He wants us to come back to that more basic level, as we see in the scriptures, of involvement with one another. He wants our lives to be with the people who are shoulder to shoulder with us, not out here on this thing. Right? We get so caught up on stuff. I've even argued with people before. I apologize to you for a couple years ago arguing about stuff that, on Facebook. I think it was you. Just about stuff that really none of us have all the knowledge about, but so easy. We just, we jump on stuff. We're not settled. We're not, so politics are the thing. And then our foot's in our mouth a week later when the person says something, we're like, oh, geez. Well, you know, we argue people down about that, but not about Jesus. God is not on the left or the right, and he's not even in the center. God is on God's side. And we should be on his side too. So, 
I don't know. I don't, I'm not very good at altar call thing um, or praying for people. But this morning, I feel like because God has really refreshed me in these things, and we've begun to kind of put some legs to it, having meetings in our home and just trying to enjoy one another again, slowing down, being the body, going after God really like we read. If there's any of you who desire that this morning and, and would like me to just agree with you for refreshing. You know, in Acts chapter 3, this is the last verse I'll read. I didn't think I would share it. And I'm at chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. It says, the council then... Oh, no, that's chapter 4. It says, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things. Oh, now repent of your sins and turn to God. <laughs> Sorry, I started on the last one. So that your sins may be wiped away, then times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. You know, Christian people, we need to repent. We do. I'm not saying any of us are so far we're on the verge to hell. There's always a chance we can do our own thing and get so far away that we look like the Laodiceans or the Church of Ephesus. Right? So if you guys would like just to agree with me in prayer, just have me pray for you along those lines, I would love to. Like I said, I don't normally do this. I don't. You know, we, we have to do what the Lord's leading us to do. And each one of us, when we leave here, will have decisions to make. good decisions, God's not pushing your way, right? But if you know what you need to do, do it. But if there's anybody in here who'd like, like me to pray with you, come on up. And I'll, I'll pray with you. If not, I'll just close this up there.